Now I'm going to talk about the other multiple comparisons solution from permutation testing, and that is extreme pixel values. So let's start. Again, we will talk about the mechanisms, and then I will mention the ass uh, assumptions. And then at the end of this video, I will compare the advantages and disadvantages or differences between cluster-based correction and pixel-based correction. All right, so pixel-based correction works in a similar way to cluster correction, except in the second loop over all of the permuted iterations. So after you've gone through one loop to create all of the null hypothesis maps, you go through a second loop, you go back through all of the permuted maps, these shuffled maps, but now you don't need to threshold. Instead, all you do is look through this map and you find two pixels. You get two pixels from this map or two pixel values. The pixel value that is the smallest, so the most negative, and the pixel value that is the most positive. So you're looking for the two extremes. Now remember, we start from the same assumption that we did in cluster correction. So we assume that this map, nothing in this map should be significant. This map is a null hypothesis. It's an empirical null hypothesis map. In theory, it should be all zeros if there's no differences between conditions. But then, of course, it's not going to be all zeros. There's sampling variability and noise and so on. So it happens that there's going to be some distribution. So we take the smallest, po the most extreme negative value and the most extreme positive value, and we say, in this entire map, these are the two values, the two extreme values that we can expect under the null hypothesis. All right, and then I think you can guess what is the next thing we do. We go to step two. We go to the iteration, the second iteration, which is the second null hypothesis map, and we do exactly the same thing. We find the largest pixel, which might be this one, and the smallest pixel, or the, you know, the, the pixel with the most extreme positive value and the pixel with the most extreme negative value, and then we repeat this for all the maps. And that's going to build up a distribution again so these two values from each map, and that distribution is going to be bimodal. It's gonna look like this with zero in the center. So these are all of the extreme negative values and the extreme positive values over our n different iterations. Maybe that's 1,000 if you did 1,000 permutations. And then we need to identify actually two thresholds, two separate thresholds. The two. So if we're using a p-value of 0.05, that would be 2.5% of the distribution. So half of 5% of the distribution on the negative tail and half of 5% of the distribution on the positive tail. And these become your two thresholds. Now it's important here to have two separate thresholds, assuming you're doing a two-tailed test, because we don't know for sure that the distribution will be mirrored. It could be that the positive values are much more positive, they're further to the right, and the negative values are only a little bit to the left. So that depends on, you know, the characteristics of the data and so on. Okay, so then you take these two thresholds and you apply them to your actual data, your observed data, and then you go through your uh, observed statistical data and then you say any pixel that is, so any, any pixel with a statistic value in the map here, that is between the 2.5th percentile and the 97.5th percentile, those pixels get turned to zero, and then whatever's left is something that we uh, will accept as being statistically significant. So it's interesting to compare the cluster correction and the extreme pixel correction. So this is the map from extreme pixel correction, this is from cluster correction that I showed uh, in the previous video. So there's a couple of differences that are noteworthy. One is that in cluster correction, you retain the entire cluster, even if individual pixels in that cluster are not really, really strongly significant. So these can be weakly significant, but because you have a lot of weakly significant pixels that are all touching each other, the entire cluster, uh, or yeah, this entire island remains one super threshold cluster. On the other hand, with pixel correction, you don't pay any attention to whether the pixels are touching each other. That is no effect. So you can have, you know, this kind of awkward thing where there's, you know, it used to be one cluster and then you, you get these like little eyelets carved out in here 
because these values had large pixel these pixels had large values these pixels had large values and you know there's a couple pixels in the middle here that had pretty relatively small values they were significant enough to survive this thresholding but they were not extreme enough they were not large enough to survive this thresholding okay so that's one observation a second observation is that with extreme pixel correction you can actually have one or maybe two pixels that are just standing by themselves like this or this this looks like a little pixel all the way up here now i don't know if this is real or not my intuition is that this is not something that i would trust this is not something that you know i would write an entire scientific paper about this one pixel but technically this does survive our statistical thresholding okay so that leads us to comparing the uh, multiple comparison correction methods so cluster correction favors big clusters or heavy clusters and i put this in red because i don't know if this is necessarily a good thing or a bad thing it is something to keep in mind that when you do cluster correction even real meaningful actually true results can be removed from your uh, results maps if they are in relatively small clusters on the other hand, extreme pixel correction can detect small clusters, even clusters that are, you know, just the size of one pixel. So cluster correction, you know, despite what I just said, it is actually a sensible approach in neuroscience. Partly that's because we induce some spatial and spectral autocorrelation by means of time frequency analysis. And also because, you know, our general understanding of how the brain works is that there is autocorrelation in brain activity over time. So cluster correction actually is a sensible approach. And with extreme uh, pixel correction, the interpretability, particularly on this one pixel issue, depends on the pixel size. So if you have actually pretty large pixels, then it's possible that interpreting one pixel is safe uh, and, and reasonable. But if you have really tiny pixels that are like one millisecond and one hertz, then yeah, if you see one significant pixel here, it's a little bit hard to believe that this finding will replicate in an independent sample. Okay, so, and then the final thing, which is a negative about a disadvantage for cluster correction, is that the sensitivity can be frequency dependent. So what do I mean by that? In time frequency analyses, there tends to be more smoothing at lower frequencies and a bit less smoothing at higher frequencies. Again, part of that is a signal processing issue about the amount of smoothing that gets imposed down here versus up here at higher frequencies. And also part of that seems to be just something about how the brain works that these lower frequencies might be present for longer and higher frequencies might be a little bit more bursty. But because lower frequency activity tends to be smoother and higher frequency activity tends to be less smooth, there's actually going to be a bias imposed by cluster correction towards the lower frequencies, which naturally have larger clusters. Now, if that is a concern, one thing you can do is to run your cluster correction twice. Let's say first only considering frequencies uh, below some threshold frequency and then run cluster correction again above the frequency. So for example, if you are looking at activity in the range of, let's say two Hertz to 120 Hertz, that's a pretty big range. Maybe you want to run your cluster correction separately for two to 40 Hertz, and then again, separately for 30, 40 to 120 Hertz. So I'm just making up these numbers, but it's just an illustration of one way to get around this possible issue. Okay, so all of this said, you know, I, I wanna present a, a fairly balanced approach here but that said cluster correction is by far the most common multiple comparisons correction method in the neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and electrophysiology literatures when doing time frequency or related analyses so i would recommend sticking to cluster correction and there's nothing wrong with extreme value uh, pixel correction, but just keep in mind it's less commonly used, I think because you still end up with a lot of these tiny little blips here that can be difficult to interpret.